Hey, Sarah. Hi, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? Good, good. Is your first presentation at Grand I, Rounds? For Grand Rounds, yes. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, so we'll wait the another six minutes and then I'll introduce you. Okay, I'm just gonna put okay, myself great. on mute. If Sounds you need good. anything, call me. Okay. You're just staring into the into the computer. Yeah, I have a computer uh, other screen that's on right now as well. Oh, oh, is that? Oh, I see. So you're not. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it doesn't look like I'm just staring into space. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. That's fine. I, I'm totally happy. I just thought I should entertain you, uh, but obviously you're entertained. So I'll wait to introduce you shortly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. So I think we're going to start Grand Rounds. <clears throat> uh, welcome, everybody. 
Um, my computer says one minute to 12, but uh, the introduction won't be that long, but uh, I'll use the one minute to uh, welcome Sarah. Uh, Sai, who's the new recruit to the Division of Geriatrics, uh, who completed her training, uh, at least part of her training at UBC, but maybe all of her training at UBC. Uh, Sarah's going to talk to us today about cognitive dysfunction and diabetes in the elderly. So Sarah, please. Thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen. I think, can you see my screen? Okay. So thank you very much for having me um, today. Um, I'm gonna be talking to you about uh, cognitive dysfunction and diabetes in older adults. Um, and like Dr. Kasson said, I did most of my training at UBC, um, internal medicine and my geriatric medicine fellowship. Um, and this past year I was at JAWS and Diabetes Center in Boston um, doing a geriatric diabetes fellowship. So I don't have any disclosures. Um, and the objectives of the talk today are to review um, the scope of the problem, uh, understand the bi-directional relationship between cognitive dysfunction and diabetes, uh, recognize the subtle changes in cognition and identify cognitive screening tools that you can use at the bedside um, or in a busy clinic setting, and finally, implement management strategies for patients with cognitive dysfunction and diabetes. So in terms of aging and diabetes, I think in the past we traditionally used to think of aging as having a higher likelihood of developing multiple medical problems, um, and as a result, um, being on multiple medications. And as for diabetes, um, it was felt that a significant health burden um, was primarily due to microvascular disease and macrovascular disease. But there's certainly um, been a shift. Um, and we know that in the elderly, um, there's a higher likelihood of having co many coexisting conditions, which we know as geriatric syndromes. Um, and these conditions can significantly impact diabetes self-care and management, such as glucose monitoring, understanding the role of diet and exercise, and following complex insulin regimens. Um, and so these geriatric syndromes are known as cognitive dysfunction, uh, frailty, falls, uh, depression, functional disability, uh, urinary incontinence, polypharmacy, and chronic pain. I don't think it's a surprise um, to anyone that our population is aging. Um, by 2030, approximately one in four individuals will be above the age of 65. Um, and actually the largest growing segment um, are those who are above the age of 80 um, as depicted in the red. Um, so certainly their um, prevalence is, is increasing. Um, and we know that there's also an increasing prevalence of dementia in Canada. Um, the prevalence doubles um, every five years for those who are above the age of 65. Um, it's about 25% in those age 85 and above. And the most common um, type of dementia um, is Alzheimer's disease, which continues to, to rise um, at a steady rate. Um, vascular disease is um, also um, quite common, but um, due to better control of cardiovascular risk factors, um, this um, prevalence is not rising as rapidly. Um, coincidentally, um, there's also a higher prevalence of diabetes among those age 65 years and above, um, with the highest um, in the ranges between age 75 to 84. Um, approximately 33% um, in males and 25 to 27% in females. Um, and this is primarily due to physiologic changes that occur with aging. Um, so with age, um, there's decrease in beta cell function. Um, there's also increased insulin resistance due to a more sedentary lifestyle, um, sarcopenia, um, as well as inflammation. And the majority of the patients who have type, uh, who have diabetes, um, who are older will be type two, um, about 90 to 95%, um, and the rest will be either type one or um, related to pancreatic disease. Um, in terms, in Canada, um, older adults with dementia and diabetes, the prevalence um, is about 17%, um, so about 900,000 
uh, Canadians have dementia and diabetes. Um, this likely represents an under, um, it, it's likely represents underrepresentation, um, just because lots of patients um, with diabetes are often asymptomatic and are not um, as rarely diagnosed. And also, there's many patients who have uh, cognitive dysfunction who are not. Um, brought to the attention of their family physicians or um, internists until more um, problems arise um, with, their, with their function. So in terms of um, association, so type 1 diabetes is associated with cognitive dysfunction. Um, there was a meta-analysis of um, 33 studies that was done in diabetes care um, many years ago um, that looked at type 1 diabetes compared to non-diabetes subjects um, and trying to see which areas of um, cognition they had um, deficits in. And what they found was that um, Patients with type 1 uh, tend to have lower performance in intelligence, um, crystallized intelligence, which is uh, primarily knowledge and facts, um, and fluid intelligence, um, the ability to reason and think. Um, there's also noted um, deficits in processing speed, um, attention, cognitive flexibility, um, and visual perception, uh, where learning um, and memory as well as language uh, remained relatively spared. In terms of type 2 diabetes and cognitive dysfunction, there is an association um, that was first demonstrated in the Rotterdam study. Um, so they looked at about 6,000 participants who were um, age 55 to 99 um, and paying close attention to those who were non-insulin dependent as well as those who were on insulin. And what they found was that for those who were not on insulin, um, who were on oral medications, they had a greater risk of developing a dementia compared to those who were not on any um, drugs at all or who were diet controlled. Um, and in particular, the patients who were on insulin therapy had an even greater association um, with um, vascular dementia, um, Alzheimer's disease, and other dementias. In terms of risk factors for developing dementia in patients with type 2, um, age is particularly the biggest risk factor. Um, and then um, Exalto and colleagues identified these other risk factors, um, including lower level of education, um, if they have less than grade 12, um, presence of microvascular disease, uh, cerebrovascular disease, cardiovascular disease, um, if they've had uh, lower extremity complications, such as diabetic foot ulcers, um, the history of depression, um, and longer duration of diabetes. Um, other risk factors that are important to note is that if um, patients have poor glycemic control um, in midlife, it really increases the risk of cognitive decline over 20 years. And this was shown in, in the ERIC study. Um, they looked at about 13,000 um, participants in the US um, who were between the ages of 48 to 67. Um, and what they found was that um, those who had, were diagnosed with diabetes had about a 19% greater cognitive decline over a 20 year period compared to those who were not diagnosed. Um, and that those who had worse control, so A1C greater than 7%, had more cognitive decline uh, compared to those who had an A1C less than 7%. Um, another risk, important risk factor for developing cognitive impairment um, is having greater glucose variability. Um, so in this study, looking at uh, patients with type 2 um, who were, had uh, continuous glucose monitors on them, what they found is that those individuals who had um, large glucose excursions um, tended to score worse on cognitive testing as demonstrated in the mini mental status exam, whereas those who had lower uh, or less um, glycemic excursions um, scored better. And I don't think it's a surprise um, to, to anyone that um, hypoglycemia um, is related to uh, dementia. Um, and in fact, there's actually a bi-directional relationship. Um, so in this study um, by Yaffe um, and colleagues in the JAMA, um, they followed um, individuals with type 2 diabetes over a 12-year period. Um, and these were older adults. Um, the average age was about 74. And what they found was that those patients that experienced a hypoglycemia event had about a two times increased risk of developing dementia uh, compared to those without hypoglycemia. And similarly, um, those patients who had dementia had about a three times increased risk 
of developing a hypoglycemia event. Um, and really, the number of hypoglycemic events um, increase the risk of uh, insulin de dementia. And that the more that you have um, that actually require hospitalization, um, the more likely you're going to develop um, dementia. So this figure um, just summarizes um, the pathophysiology um, of the mediating mechanisms that uh, contribute to the development of dementia um, in patients with diabetes. Um, so certainly um, there's a genetic predisposition, um, but there's also core mo morbid disease such as hypertension, dyslipidemia, and obesity that play a role. Um, there's um, macrovascular disease such as stroke, uh, which can lead to more of a vascular type picture, um, and also microvascular disease um, with ischemia um, and functional hyperanemia that can also contribute to a vascular type um, picture. Um, hyperglycemia in itself um, can lead to oxidative stress, um, mitochondrial dysfunction, events, protein glycation. Um, hypoglycemia um, leads to permanent neuronal cell death, um, platelet aggregation, um, and damage to the neuronal receptors in the hippocampus, which is responsible for memory. Um, and finally, there's with insulin resistance, it impairs the amyloid beta protein clearance. So as a result, you get deposition leading to plaques. Um, there's hyperphosphorylation of tau leading to neurofib neurofibrillary tangles um, and increased inflammation. And there's changes in neurotransmitters um, which contribute to more of an Alzheimer's type um, pattern um, for pathology. Um, so really in the elderly, it's a combination of ischemic factors um, as well as degenerative changes um, that lead to dementia. Um, and why is this um, important? Um, it's important because um, cognitive dysfunction is also associated with poor glycemic control. Um, my colleague, Meta Munchi in Boston, um, she looked at patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes um, and administered cognitive testing on them in, to see whether there is a difference in uh, glycemic control as measured by hemoglobin A1c. Um, and what she found was that there is a, a significant difference um, and that those individuals who have cognitive dysfunction tend to have more poor glycemic control. They also have higher functional disability, uh, hearing and vision impairment are, are more likely to fall. Cognitive dysfunction also impacts diabetes self-care as well as the use of care services. Um, Alan Sinclair from the UK um, administered cognitive testing in patients with diabetes um, to see what impact it would have on their activities of daily living, um, diabetes self-care. And what he found was that those individuals who had uh, lower cognitive testing as measured by the mini mental status exam, um, they were more likely to be unable to manage their own medications. Um, they, were, they could not um, do self-monitoring of blood glucose. They were more likely to live in a residential care um, or long-term care um, setting. They were dependent um, on their basic and instrumental activities of daily living. Um, and they also had very poor self, um, very poor diabetes knowledge. Um, there's also other important cognitive dysfunction outcomes that um, should not be overlooked. Um, so these patients are at increased um, risk of mortality um, as well as morbidity. They have high risk of delirium. Um, oftentimes, um, behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia are associated with the disease. Um, there's loss of capacity and control. Um, our patients with cognitive dysfunction are at high risk for elder abuse. Um, and also, especially during this time, there's a lot of uh, caregiver stress um, uh, on families um, who are looking after these, these individuals. Um, and finally, um, geri uh, cognitive dysfunction is associated with other geriatric syndromes, um, such as frailty, um, falls, polypharmacy. In terms of system-related um, outcomes, there's increased healthcare costs, um, increased hospitalizations and emergency department visits. Uh, there's paid and unpaid caregiving, caregiving expenses. Um, these patients are at um, three times increased risk of ending up in long-term care um, or they end up in hospice. Um, so that brings us um, to the importance of identifying patients uh, with cognitive dysfunction 
um, who have diabetes. And I'm just going to present two cases of patients that I encountered during uh, my geriatric diabetes fellowship um, who were not initially identified as having cognitive dysfunction as they presented quite well. Um, and sometimes it can be um, difficult um, to identify these patients and I'll give you some, um, some tips um, in the next few slides. So Mrs. A, um, she is a 74-year-old woman. Um, she was a retired librarian um, living at home alone. And she had type 1 diabetes um, for 52 years. Um, she was on a Medtronic Minimed 670G insulin pump. Um, she was checking her finger sticks at least five times per day. And over the past year, her hemoglobin A1C had been trending upwards from 8.8% to 10.2%. Um, she had been telling um, her healthcare professionals that she's been winging her boluses um, and not really using her bolus wizard um, and that she just really needed to focus on her health um, and that she was going to get it. She was going to be able to fix all of her issues with her diabetes. Um, and so when I saw her, um, this was her glucometer readings. Um, so you can see that her, she's having wide glucose excursions. Um, she's checking really at any time of the day. Um, and she's also having episodes of hypoglycemia as well. The other patient that I saw um, was Mrs. B. Uh, she was a 84 year old retired saleswoman living alone at home. She also had type one um, since the age of 45. And she was on a basal insulin 22 units in the morning uh, with a mealtime insulin sliding scale. Um, she informed me that sometimes she skipped her meals because she didn't want to cook. Her hemoglobin A1C was 9.6%. Um, and she had some multiple episodes of hypoglycemia uh, requiring emergency department visits. Twice she was found unconscious in the street. Um, and when I asked her about her memory, she told me, don't worry, de worry dear, I've got it. Um, and so this was her glucometer um, readings that she had. And very similar to Mrs. A, she had um, wide glucose excursions. She was having multiple episodes of hypoglycemia uh, throughout the daytime. Um, and clearly there is something, some other underlying issues um, in related to her diabetes management. So I'll return at the end of the presentation to these cases on how um, we resolved um, their, um, how we approached um, their diabetes management. So in terms of how to recognize cognitive dysfunction, um, sometimes it can be um, very challenging because the initial changes in cognition are often subtle um, and they can manifest in different ways. Um, it may not be um, very obvious until the patient has multiple deficits. Um, and therefore, collateral history um, from family members and or caregivers um, is extremely helpful to determine if there's been a change in memory or a change uh, in cognition. Um, or function. Um, and so early recognition of cognitive dysfunction is important um, so that the patient can receive a diagnosis uh, as well as receive appropriate treatment um, for maximizing function and ensuring good quality of life, um, to provide education and psychosocial support for the patient as well as for their family and caregivers, um, and to engage them in shared decision making regarding life planning, health care, and financial matters. So there is a spectrum of cognitive dysfunction um, that I just want to remind everyone. Um, so there's normal aging, um, which should not have any cognitive deficits per se, um, and it should be preserved function. Um, patients um, typically may have some issues with processing speed um, and oh, word finding difficulties here and there, but it's not affecting function at all. Uh, mild cognitive impairment, these patients continue to have preserved function with some um, subtle cognitive deficits. Mild dementia, um, there's impairment of instrumental activities of daily living. Um, so these are higher level tasks such as medication management, um, managing their finances, driving, cooking, shopping, using the telephone. For patients with moderate dementia, um, they cannot do any of their instrumental activities of daily living. Um, they're still able to do their basic activities of daily living, um, which would include dressing, grooming, toileting, ambulating, and feeding. Um, and finally, severe dementia, they're dependent for all of their activities of daily living. <clears throat> 
In terms of the neurocognitive domains, um, so for based on DSM-5 criteria, there's six neurocognitive domains of importance. Um, there's language, uh, learning and memory, social cognition, complex attention, executive function, and perceptual motor or, or visual spatial. Um, and in patients um, with type 2 diabetes, um, the neurocognitive domains that are typically affected um, include executive, executive function um, and learning and memory. So in terms of the signs of cognitive dysfunction and impact on diabetes self-care, um, if your patients are having um, difficulties with memory and learning, um, some ways that they may manifest is that they forget clinic appointments or they may arrive late. Um, they ask for the same information uh, each time. They may forget to bring their glucometer or their logbook or monitor their glucose, um, forget to take oral medications and or injections. Um, they may forget to eat on time. They often rely on family members for things that they used to be able to handle on their own. Um, and they often tell you that they need memory aids, like they're writing things down on paper or they're relying more on a calendar or they're re relying on their family for reminders. In terms of executive function, um, these patients um, present as remembering the instructions but unable to implement them into practice. Um, they're not able to treat um, hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. Um, they're not able to use a sliding scale. Um, they may not be able to calculate carbohydrates. They often make errors um, when their old routines are changed um, and they may refuse new therapies and seem stubborn um, in their ways. Um, these patients often are not able to seek help or troubleshoot, um, and they may have difficulty refilling their prescriptions. In terms of perceptual motor function, um, these patients will have difficulties with visual tasks, um, so particularly checking their finger stick glucose, um, using the glucometer. Um, they may not be able to perform pump site insertion and, and or attach their infusion set correctly. Um, for language, um, they may have difficulties understanding the instructions or filling out forms. Um, they might have, be unable to express themselves and have word finding difficulties um, or even um, not be able to comprehend the meaning of a word. And finally, for complex attention, um, they have a lot of difficulty paying attention in environments with multiple stimuli or in group settings. Um, they don't do well in group teaching. Um, they often seem distracted or tangential when you converse with them, and they may take longer to process information. In terms of some red flags um, for cognitive dysfunction, and this is really if you're encountering a patient with these red flags, it should prompt further investigation. Um, so if your patient has sudden worsening of glycemic control um, when they used to have a really good track record, um, if their hemoglobin A1C or finger stick readings remain the same or worse, despite efforts to increase medication. Um, and finally, if the patient reports feeling overwhelmed or endorsing diabetes-related distress, um, that should prompt you to think um, potentially about cognitive dysfunction. So in terms of cognitive testing, um, there's three levels of rigor. Um, so the first um, level would be screening tests um, that you can do at the bedside um, or in your clinic. Um, the second level is a, an extended men mental status exam, which typically takes about 60 minutes um, to administer. And um, that's not quite feasible um, in a busy clinic setting or by the bedside. Um, and the gold standard um, for cognitive testing is a formal neuropsychological evaluation um, where the patient undergoes multiple cognitive tests. It typically takes about four hours or more. So in terms of the short screening tests um, that we have available, um, I think most of you are familiar with the uh, mini mental status exam, um, as well as the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Um, so both of these tests are 30 items. Um, they test different um, cognitive domains. Um, they're both copyrighted, um, and right now the MOCA um, administration requires certification um, if you want to use it. Um, the mini mental status exam does not test executive function, so that's important to keep in mind, um, especially uh, given that most patients with diabetes will present with executive dysfunction. Um, and the Mini mental status exam and the Montreal cognitive assessment really rely on education um, and language. So if your patient has 
low level of education um, or English is not their first language, um, then these tests will be difficult for them. Um, other more short um, screening bedside tools or clinic tools that you can use um, include the MINICOG. Um, and which I'll go over in the next couple of slides. This is a two minute test. Um, its sensitivity and specificity um, are quite good at 86% to 91% respectively. Um, it has been validated um, in patients with um, diabetes. Um, and then there's also um, the clock in the box test, which is a modified clock drawing test. Um, it takes about three minutes um, and it correlates well with um, the mini mental status exam uh, in neuropsychological testing. So in terms of the mini-cog, um, the steps that it entails is a first a three-word registration. Um, and uh, if you go onto the mini-cog website, um, there's many different examples and also it's available in different languages. Um, so an example would be banana sunrise chair. You then ask the patient to draw a clock, put in all the numbers and set the time to 10 past 11. And then it's followed up um, by the three-word recall. So in terms of the scoring um, system, uh, the word recall um, is three points, uh, the clock draw is two points and it's out of um, five in total. Um, so if the patient um, is able to recall three words and they have a normal clock, um, then they pass the test. Um, if they're able to recall one to two words and they still have a normal clock, um, they pass the test. If at any point in time they don't recall any of the words um, or they have an abnormal clock, um, then they fail the mini cog and it should prompt further cognitive testing. In terms of the clock in the box test, um, so this is um, uh, where you ask the patient um, in the blue box uh, to draw a picture of the clock. Uh, put in all the numbers and set the time to 10 after 11. Um, and this uh, will test more of executive function um, for these patients. Um, and there's a scoring system where um, you score them based on whether they put the clock in the right box um, and then how well they drew their clock. So in terms of strategies to implement in patients with cognitive dysfunction um, and diabetes, um, so the, I think one of the bigger questions that's often asked is, does tighter control uh, improve cognition? Um, and results from the cord mine uh, looking at 3,000 patients um, who are average age of 63 years old, um, either um, uh, divided up into intensive control less than 6% or standard control uh, 7 to 7.9%. What they found was that there was really no change um, of cognitive testing um, for the intensive control um, versus the standard um, therapy at 20 month, month um, and at 40 month follow up. Um, and they really looked at different cognitive tests. Um, so they did uh, the mini mental status exam. Um, the Stroop test uh, was mainly focusing on executive function. Um, the RA uh, VLD uh, was uh, looking at uh, memory um, and the DSST was looking at processing speed. Uh, and unfortunately there was no difference. Um, and so, um, and with other studies um, looking at medications, there's really no medications um, that have been shown to improve cognition um, in patients who um, have diabetes um, and cognitive dysfunction. So how do we approach these patients um, with diabetes and cognitive dysfunction? Um, and my colleague, um, Meta Munchi, created this um, algorithm and these steps um, that you can use to approach um, a patient that you may encounter uh, with these two conditions. Um, so the first thing um, is to screen for comorbid diseases um, and identify any uh, coexisting geriatric syndromes. Um, it's also important to know the patient's functional status um, and identify barriers to self-care. The next step is to identify caregivers and other support systems establish individualized goals and develop best strategies to achieve these goals. And in order to do that, um, she outlines three um, guiding principles. Um, the first is liberalization, the second is simplification, and the third is de-intensification. Um, so liberalizing um, Zation remains um, liberalizing the A1C goal or finger stick glucose range. Simplification means lowering the treatment complexity to match the patient's coping and management skills. 
um, and trying to avoid sliding scales and trying to decrease the number of insulin injections and frequency of glucose monitoring. Um, next um, is de-intensification, um, trying to decrease the burden of therapy by stopping unnecessary or harmful medications um, and decreasing the number of daily medications or, if possible, using long-acting formulations. Um, so in terms of establishing individualized goals, um, for our pa older patients, um, we pay close attention to um, comorbidities, functional status, geriatric syndromes, and life expectancy. Um, and a patient who has um, dementia, um, they often have um, multiple comorbidities. Their functional status may be poor. They have often associated geriatric syndromes such as frailty or falls, um, and their life expectancy uh, may be more limited. Um, and so that's why um, these patients, they're more unlikely to reap the benefits of tight control and more likely to experience side effects and adverse outcomes. And so really for these patients, it's all about um, avoiding hypoglycemia. Um, in older adults, um, they have less hypoglycemia awareness. Um, and if they're particularly having it overnight, these symptoms can go unrecognized. They can end up having um, falls um, or other um, consequences. Um, and really tight control requires diligent um, diabetes self-care, um, which these patients may be able to do. Um, so in terms of hypoglycemia, I've already linked to fractures, but other consequences include cerebrovascular events, arrhythmias and cardiovascular events, uh, dementia and delirium, um, emergency department visits, hospitalizations, and death. And so that's why um, in the most recent diabetes, they really have separated um, into um, functional status as well as frailty and whether the patient has cognitive dysfunction. Um, and so for the patients with uh, dementia, there's liberalization of the A1C targets um, to less than 8.5% um, and more um, uh, liberalization of the CBG targets as well, uh, with preprandial being six to nine millimoles per liter and postprandial less than 14. Um, we try and keep it less than 14 because at, um, if it's greater than that, then it can lead to glucosuria um, and dehydration and could contribute to falls. Um, so it's this another guiding principle is simplifying the diabetes treatment plan. Um, and this is really to ensure that the patient and caregiver can follow the plan consistently. Um, to minimize the risk of hypoglycemia as well as hyperglycemia um, and decrease the frequency of glucose monitoring and reduce the number of insulin injections. Um, I'm not going to discuss um, oral medications during this talk as um, Dr. Darris did discuss them um, in his talk last month at Grand Rounds, um, but I think that one of the areas of challenge um, for patients with diabetes and cognitive dysfunction is when they're on um, insulin. Um, and so when I think about insulin, there's a multiple daily insulin injections that these patients can be on, um, either basal, basal bolus uh, insulin regimen, uh, mixed insulin, um, insulin sliding scale, or a combination um, of the above. Um, and so a typical scenario that you may encounter is that um, the patient cannot manage multiple daily insulin injection, um, or they rely on a caregiver that can only come once a day. Um, and so um, Metamunchi um, did a study looking at um, older adults and whether uh, we could simplify their insulin regimen and whether it had an impact on their A1C, their glycemic control, um, hypoglycemia risk. Um, and I'll just show you the results of what she found and also I'll share with you the algorithm that she created that can be quite helpful uh, in approaching these patients. Um, so she looked at um, 65 um, older adults um, whose average age was about 76. Um, they were on about 3.7 insulin injections per day, um, and A1C average was 7.7%. 23% .7%. Um, of them were living alone, 25% had cognitive dysfunction, 40% had depression, and 26% had a history of falls. Um, and through this uh, insulin simplification algorithm, um, what she was able to do is um, decrease 
hypoglycemia duration um, from 277 minutes at baseline to 111 minutes at five months and then 97 minutes at eight months without any change in A1C or glycemic control. Um, and the patients had improvement of their diabetes-related distress scores at a five-month period as well as eight-month period. So in terms of um, basal insulin simplification, um, you can use um, any long-acting basal insulin, whether it's glargine, basal glargadetamir, deglutec. Um, and what you want to do is change the timing of basal insulin from bedtime to morning. Um, and the reason that to this is because overnight gluconeogenesis in older adults is not as prominent as in younger patients. Morning, you decrease the risk of having hypoglycemia overnight where symptoms are more likely to go unrecognized. Um, and finally, um, if the caregiver can only come once a day, it's more typically more convenient for them to have a morning uh, dosing. And what you want to do is titrate um, the basal insulin weekly to a fasting glucose between 5 to 8.3 millimoles per liter. Um, and this can change based on your patient's overall health status. Um, if more than 50% of the fasting finger stick readings per week are higher than goal, then you want to increase the basal by two units. If more than two finger stick readings per week are less than 5 millimeters per, mol per mole, then decrease the basal by two units. Um, if your patient is on mixed insulin, you want to use 70% of the total dose as basal uh, in the morning. In terms of mealtime insul insulin simplification, um, if your patient is using less than 10 units uh, per dose of mealtime insulin, you may actually be able to get away with not using um, insulin um, at meals at all. Um, and you can actually discontinue the mealtime insulin and use a non-insulin agent such as a metformin or a DPP-4 inhibitor, SGLT2 inhibitor, um, or a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Um, but if the patient cannot tolerate non-insulin agents, um, they rely on caregivers or they tend to forget their mealtime insulin, um, sometimes using a fixed dose uh, mealtime insulin can be helpful um, to avoid any carbohydrate counting or combining um, NPH or a premixed insulin with a basal insulin. And I'll go over that in the next couple of slides. Um, so for patients who have um, primarily hyperglycemia uh, in the afternoon, um, you can still give them the long acting um, basal in the morning to decrease their overall glucose levels. And then you can capitalize on the pharmacodynamics of NPH to address afternoon hyperglycemia. Um, NPH um, tends to peak around six hours and can last up to 12 to 18 hours. And so it really will address the um, afternoon um, highs that the patient is experiencing. Um, and this is only two injections per day that can all be given um, in the morning time by the caregiver. Um, initially, when you start this regimen, you will need to check um, the CBG um, the fasting CBG to titrate the long-acting insulin. Um, and it's also good to check um, the pre-supper um, blood glucose just to make sure that they're not having hypoglycemia related to the NPH. Um, for patients who um, tend to have a lot of hyperglycemia related to meals, um, particularly from breakfast, um, what you can do is uh, combine with your long-acting insulin, uh, pre-mixed insulin. Uh, with NPH and R, uh, where the R will take care of the breakfast meal and then the NPH will take care of the afternoon hyperglycemia. Um, and again, this is two injections per day um, that the caregiver can give uh, in the morning. Um, one important thing to note is that for um, these insulin management strategies where you're combining basal insulin with either premixed or NPH, um, is that your patient has to be eating regularly. Um, if your patient skips a meal, then they run the risk of having hypoglycemia. Um, so for patients who tend to have just one meal that is the main culprit, it may actually be better just to use a fixed mealtime dose um, for that meal um, and then continue them on a long-acting insulin. Um, 
In terms of insulin sliding scale, um, so we don't like to use them uh, in the community as they tend to be uh, more reactive um, and can lead to la large glucose um, variability. Um, so this is just an example here to just show you um, if the patient has a normal blood sugar at breakfast time, they don't get any units as per sliding scale, um, but really they're not getting any coverage for their breakfast. So as a result, at lunchtime, they end up running high, they get two units per sliding scale, they come back down for dinner time um, blood sugar. Um, but unfortunately, because of the sliding scale, they're within range, so they don't get any units at all. And subsequently at bedtime, uh, they end up running high. Um, it also increases the burden for patients, um, so they have to check their finger sticks more frequently. Um, and particularly in patients with cognitive dysfunction, um, they're more likely of making errors. Um, the American Geriatric Society Beers criteria lists insulin sliding scales of ha as having higher risk of hypoglycemia without actually improving um, hyperglycemia management. So how can we simplify an insulin sliding scale? Um, so if it's being used as the sole mode of insulin treatment, or in addition to basal insulin, um, recommend stopping the insulin sliding scale um, using a non-insulin agent instead, or using a fixed mealtime insulin dose, or giving 50% of the average daily sliding scale as a basal insulin. The insulin sliding scale is used in addition to basal bolus. Um, what you can do is stop the insulin sliding scale. If the scale is being used frequently, add the average correction dose to the preceding mealtime insulin dose, or use a simplified correction scale that doesn't require so much um, uh, titration. Um, so an example of a correction scale would be if the CBG is greater than 10, you can give two additional units of mealtime insulin. If the CBG is greater than 16, you give four units of additional mealtime insulin. Um, some other practical tips um, for patients who are ins on insulin. Um, so if they're waking up with flows, um, as I discussed earlier, changing the bedtime um, basal insulin to morning uh, can be helpful. And then you can titrate um, the basal insulin to a fasting glucose between 5 to 8.3. Um, avoid bedtime correction insulin. Um, so I find particularly with my patients is that um, if they check their blood sugars at bedtime, they tend to overreact, uh, giving themselves an initial bolus of correction, followed by another one because they may forget that they actually gave themselves a bolus in the first place. Um, so I actually just tell my patients to not check their blood sugars at bedtime um, because it causes them anxiety and that leads them to, over, to overreact. Um, and then some patients may need, require um, a bedtime snack. In terms of management strategies um, for patients with cognitive dysfunction, um, so if they have memory loss, such as they're forgetting to take their medications um, or forgetting to monitor their insulin or eat on time, um, blister packing their oral medications uh, can be quite helpful. Um, setting reminder alerts, so some patients um, they can set on their flip phones um, or on their clocks um, alarms um, on when to take medications. Um, decreasing the number of pills and injections can be helpful for these patients. Um, using long acting formulations for the oral medications. Um, involving caregivers um, if possible. Um, and if they don't have a caregiver, um, arranging for home health support um, or having the pharmacy um, do insulin administration and, and uh, checking um, glucose monitoring. Um, and these patients um, would benefit from being referred to geriatric medicine or neurology uh, for ongoing support around their memory loss and also for consideration of cholinesterase inhibitors. Um, if the patient has issues with problem-solving difficulties, um, like I mentioned before, remembering instructions, but they can't implement it into practice, um, I find it very helpful to provide uh, repeated um, education with simple written instructions. Avoid these complex insulin regimens. Um, avoid very high risk of hypoglycemia if possible. Um, and providing um, the care with education and support. And for those patients who have um, primarily difficulty with changing behaviors, um, small changes at a 
with written instructions and close follow-up follow -up are often needed. I find that I often have some of my patients come to structure every week um, to check on them to make sure that they're on track. And like I mentioned earlier, one behavioral change at a time Sorry, I think I got disconnected there. I think you did. I'm just going to share my, my slides again. Sorry, Dr. Kasson, I'm not sure when I got disconnected. If you could just well, let me know, I could probably the information. In the last two minutes uh, of your presentation, we were. Yeah, we were only hearing you intermittently. Sorry, I could I couldn't really hear you there. Could you repeat that? I said in the it's about the last minute or two of your presentation, we began hearing you intermittently. So, uh, we you'd gone through the insulin sliding scale and the practical points, and uh, you it was just just maybe the last thirty seconds. Okay, the last 30 seconds, okay. Sorry, I'm not sure why I keep on getting disconnected, but um, we don't have too many more slides left. Um, so I was talking about management strategies um, for patients with cognitive dysfunction. Um, so for those who have um, memory loss, um, blister packing the medications, um, providing reminder alerts for them either on their phone or on their clocks um, can be helpful. Um, decreasing the number of pills um, and injections, uh, using long-acting oral formulations um, if possible, um, involving caregivers, um, so having home health um, for support, um, and this can be arranged for case management, or using pharmacy um, for insulin injections and for monitoring of blood glucose. Um, these patients also would benefit from being referred to geriatric medicine uh, or neurology for ongoing support regarding cognitive dysfunction and consideration for cholinesterase inhibitors. Um, for patients who have problem solving difficulties, um, so repeating um, education uh, with simple written instructions can be helpful. Um, avoiding these complex uh, insulin regimens um, or regimens with high risk of hypoglycemia if possible. Um, providing caregiver education, particularly around hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia management. Um, and for those patients who have difficulty changing behaviors, um, I find that small changes at a time with written instructions can be quite helpful um, and that close follow-up is often needed. Um, so I often have to call these patients who have cognitive dysfunction every two weeks or so just to make sure that they're on track. Um, and as I mentioned before, having one behavioral change at a time uh, can be helpful. And finally, caregiver education. So just coming back um, to the cases that I presented earlier um, for you. So Mrs. A, um, she was a 74-year retired librarian who was living alone at home with type 1 uh, who was on an insulin pump. And she had a hemoglobin A1C who had been trending upwards uh, to 10.2% over the past year. Um, she was really just winging it, um, not using her bolus wizard um, and saying that she just needed to focus on her health um, to get it. Um, and so she failed her mini cog um, assessment and I contacted her daughter um, who informed me that the patient was actually having a lot of difficulties with visual spatial orientation. Um, so she actually had difficulties pouring coffee into a cup. Um, she was getting lost while walking to the local grocery store. Um, she had difficulties with driving. Um, she was not able to properly attach her insulin pump site uh, to her body. Um, and there was times uh, where she would attach it to her chest or to her back. And she also had evidence of executive dysfunction. She was not able um, to calculate carbohydrates as she did in the past. Um, and she was struggling with changes uh, of routine. In terms of her Montreal Cognitive Assessment, um, so she scored 18 out of 30. Um, normal is typically greater than 26. And where she really had difficulties was in the area of visual spatial executive function. She couldn't do the trails properly or copy the cube. Her clock was 
very poorly done. Um, she was filling in numbers in different orders and could not indicate the time. Um, and she had significant uh, deficits and delayed recall. So for her, her management strategy, um, she was very fortunate in that uh, she was able to move next door to her daughter who actually worked from home. Um, we were able, we discontinued the insulin pump because it was actually too dangerous for her to continue on this, on, on the device. Um, and we simplified her to basal insulin with fixed mealtime doses to avoid any carbohydrate counting. Um, her daughter was um, very involved in her care and was able to actually give her the insulin injections um, throughout the day. Um, she had a pill box um, for the oral medications and we were able to utilize a continuous glucose monitor that had a share feature um, that would notify her daughter if um, she was trending upwards towards hyperglycemia or if she was turning downwards towards hypoglycemia. Um, and her daughter also created some individualized reminder strategies um, so that her mother would remember to take her, her medication, her oral pills. And this patient ended up following up with geriatric medicine. Um, in terms of Mrs. B, so she's a 84 year old uh, retired saleswoman um, who was living alone with type one diabetes. Um, she was on basal insulin, uh, 22 units in the morning with a mealtime insulin slotting scale. Uh, her A1C was 9.6% 9 with frequent episodes of hypoglycemia, often skipping meals because she didn't want to cook, um, and she failed the clock in the box test. Um, this was her Montreal Cognitive Assessment that I administered. Um, so she scored 12 out of 30. She really had deficits in all of the domains, um, particularly executive function, um, as well as delayed recall. Um, she also had difficulty of understanding how to fill out forms properly. Um, for this form, really, you just she just needed to indicate a check mark, um, but she started writing zero, two, no, no, no. Um, so her understanding um, of instructions, um, especially if they were complicated, uh, was limited. So in terms of her management strategy, um, we stopped um, her sliding scale. Um, she continued on basal insulin in the morning um, and with home health, um, we actually started premixed insulin for her. Uh, given, we really found out that she, she does like to eat food, it's just that she couldn't prepare the meals because she lost her ability to cook. Um, and so with prepared meals, um, she was eating three net meals regularly throughout the day. Um, and she also followed up with geriatric medicine. So in summary, uh, cognitive dysfunction and diabetes are common in older adults and have a bi-directional relationship. Um, cognitive dysfunction can negatively impact glycemic control and diabetes self-care tasks. Um, short screening tools such as the mini cog or clock in the box tests can be helpful in a busy clinic setting. Um, and then finally, it is important to establish individualized and simplified diabetes management plans that are feasible and safe for the patient and caregiver for liberalization, deintensification, and or simplification. Um, so I'd like to thank you for your attention today, um, and I'm open to answering any questions or um, if you have any comments, um, I welcome them. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I'll let others uh... Any questions or comments for uh, Sarah? Sarah, that was a fan. It's Grady. That was a fantastic talk. Although I realize that this is probably a, a complete talk in itself. Can you just comment a bit on the use of glucose sensors in this population? Yeah. So um, I've found that um, the glucom the continuous glucose monitoring can be very helpful, um, particularly for the caregivers. Um, and as well as for even the patients themselves with cognitive dysfunction, um, just knowing whether they're trending upwards or downwards um, can prevent having episodes of hypoglycemia or severe hyperglycemia. Um, I find that though that with patients who have moderate to severe dementia, they, they cannot use these continuous glucose monitors and really um, it's the caregiver that can that really benefits from, um, from this information as a tool to prevent um, the hypo and the hyperglycemia. Thank you. Any other questions for uh, Sarah? If not, thank you very much for the presentation, Sarah. Um, I see you spent your year well in Boston and uh, you're gonna help those of us that are here uh, transmit your information to our patients. Um, want to make sure that people 
uh, attend Grand Rounds next week. Grand Rounds next week is going to be presented by the Division of General Internal Medicine, Dr. Kay Whisker. And uh, true to the nature of general internal medicine, um, the topic will be announced later in the week. So thank you very much for everybody's participation and thank you again to Sarah. Thanks.